welcome to do our things matter uh, the way we're going to start this out is each of these folks are going to take a minute or two and introduce themselves slash perhaps take a position on this question or others and i guess we'll start with brenda hi everybody i'm brenda um do our things matter so i was talking i, I was kind of having a pre-panel discussion uh this morning and the question was do our things matter to to whom uh, or to who uh and and i guess to me personally they matter because i don't feel like i've got a choice but to make them uh, i'm working on two games actively right now uh and i i'm just making them because i have to i guess just because it pleases me and because they feel unfinished and it would feel wrong not to do it I don't know whether they matter to anybody else. You know, one of the games that I'm working on, I doubt anybody will see it, and I don't care. Particularly if I just finish it and it goes into a box in the garage. That's that's a good enough point for me. Um, and do they matter at large? Do they, there's some people to whom they may not even matter at all. You know, they just sort of uh, scoff at our games and the whole art game movement, as it's sometimes referred to. Um, but I think they do matter. It's free from commercial constraints. They push the envelope forward, uh, maybe in ways that we're not able to even immediately recognize at the time. But I think that they are absolutely critical um, to just in and of themselves and to uh, the larger game industry overall. Uh, my name is Robert Moore, and uh, uh, do I games my life? I, I, uh, I'm in full agreement. So thank you, that was short. Um, <clears throat> my, uh, I, I do think it's worth noting, though, that, uh, that our games won, um, which I, I pointed out earlier this year, and it just kind of snuck up on us, which is, um, I, I think, less than a decade ago, when you looked at, you know, would our games be recognized as being capable of making high art? Would they ever be you know, talked about by art critics? Would they be shown in galleries? Uh, I think it was uh, unlikely it certainly wasn't accepted, and now, I mean, it is. It's just, it's just a fact that it happened, and we won. And it was suspiciously easy, uh, <laughs> which I think most of us were expecting some kind of great struggle from the gatekeepers, and instead they sort of opened up the door to the, the salon and said, well, yes, come on over here. Take a seat right over the music and dance. Now, pray tell, show us what you've got. And I think that's the stage we're uh, kind of in, and I think John might talk about why it was uh, so easy, because the art establishment, such as it is, is kind of moved on from uh, certain forms being defined as art anyway. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm a happy camper when it comes to uh, the progress we've made, and the rest is I'm very similar to Brenda, which is they matter to me an awful lot, and I just like making them. Right, um, I'm Daniel. I made uh, a couple of games, like Today I Die and I Wish I Were the Moon, which uh, sort of fell under the category of in our games. I, when I started making them, I was not really sure what I was doing. Um, they sort of accidentally ended up being arguments. Um, in regards to what you were saying, Rod, about, you know, the arguments winning, I think something else actually happened, which is, um, now it has become sort of a genre, right? right? Uh, like, how many of you could claim that you could, you know, look at a game and recognize it's an argument? You could say, yeah, this is an argument, look an argument, somebody made an argument, right? But, you know, uh, that's sort of, um, it seems like a very hard question to answer. Is this game an argument or not? That sounds really hard. But, but uh, this thing happened, which many games came out, which felt under, they had this common thing to them, in which some of them, you know, uh, they rely heavily on thematic elements that were not commonly used in games, like, Morning or, or loss or sadness and all that stuff, but sort of uh, did not did not explore actually uh, you know the core of what games are. It was really not a, a deep exploration to that front. It was just taking the liberty of exploring themes using you know loose gameplay, uh, using themes that were not common, and now people recognize a lot of games, like including my own work, as our games just because they share that common trait of, you know, tackling unusual things, not because they're trying to do something really different from what the traditional arts do. So uh, what I think happened is that there's there's now this, this, this new genre of games that are artists, which is totally fine. 
they did not exist before as, 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 a, as a category of games, but they sort of are not actually what you know this R game movement was going to be about. Right? They are they just they, they they got stuck in that niche uh, without progressing forward. But I don't want to talk that much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Let's write it down. Let me think for a second. Uh, hi, I'm Leo Stern. Um, yeah, so I've never really used that term myself, art game, but uh, I, I know what it means. And uh, I think, uh, well, my perspective is I come probably from uh, people on the panel from the kind of more traditional art world. I'm an artist, I've been an artist for about 15 years, and then more recently, I started calling myself an artist slash game designer. So I really started making, you know, sculptures, videos, performances, um, prints, things like that. Um, and uh, at some point, I was very interested in games as a social, cultural phenomenon. So a lot of my work was themed around games and questions that come out of games. Uh, this is like around the mid-late 90s, and then the art world, or the new media art world, kind of coined a term called game art, which is different than art game. And it's basically a group of artists who are making art around games. And this was at the time, you know, mid-90s. So a lot of mods and machinima and installations themed around games. Um, and. Um, I guess what's what's interesting to me in watching the transition of uh, my own work and also kind of work that, that we'll, we're talking about today called game art is that the shift I think used to be that the, the fact that the thing needs to be um, compelling as a game was never important for game art. So it was the, the, comp the whatever made game art compelling had very little to do with game mechanics, fun, replayability, balance, anything we think about uh, with a game designer had, it was just about getting kind of a message across or a visual aesthetic. I think when the transition happened, um, and especially for me, suddenly this, and I said, I really want to make games also that function as art that can kind of live in both worlds, um, things got really hard for me. <laughs> and I'm still trying to work it out because you know, if you have some kind of impulse, some emotional reaction, something you've experienced and you want to communicate it via a game, and let's say that thing is not really a perfect match for things we expect from games. So it's not about action, it's not about uh, pyrotechnics, it's not happy, it's not fun at all. You end up making these sort of counter games, games that are not fun, games that are slow, games that are not about competition, games that involve winning and losing, and before you you notice you end up making a bad game um, <laughs> that nobody wants to play, and people who like games and understand games and are passionate about games say, oh, your game sucks. It's art, it sucks as a game. So this challenge of kind of where that intersection lies, how can you make something that in a way works as art, and we can't, it's hard to define that, so we can try, but I don't want to talk too much about that. Uh, and it's hard to define games, too. But that intersection, I think, is what makes things difficult. But I do think it would be interesting to look, again, beyond the scope of this panel, at more look, look at art games as, you know, however you define it, and also look at game art and see kind of how those things relate to each other. One, we have really, the, the art games need to work as games, and the game art do not need to work as games. And I think that's at least a lot of what I struggle with. How do you make things work as a game and as something compelling as an artwork? Yeah, yeah. fun ruining everything. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's a it's an important divide to bring up. For the, the game art is, you know, Rod's point about we won. Um, depending upon what who we is, that winning happened about 100 years ago, right? It's not something very recent at all. The Surrealist, the Dada folks, more recently, Flux's artist, and so on. More recently than that, people like Corey Archangel, Andito, Julian Oliver, Jody, the list goes on. Um, so that, that war was won 
if it was a war, a long, long time ago. Uh, you know, the, the whole idea of what art games are really kind of revolves around the Holy Trinity. The marriage, passage, break. <laughs> and from the point of view of art games, right? And is that a bad thing? Is that a bad thing? <laughs> not, not necessarily. Okay. <laughs> but in some ways it is, right? Like Brenda raised this point in email, is like, is that all we ever have to trot out when we start talking about art games? The path. Yeah, the path, yes. Which there's uh, folks who, you know, might say I, that I, I, I can answer that. Yeah. Okay. I can answer that as, as I vomited out one of those games. Yeah. Um, the, uh, I, I, I think that the only reason they're really spoken about is um, it was the, there was like a mini wave there of like three years mm -hmm. where it kind of got onto a lot of um, uh, people who were interested in taking the medium of gaming further. And I think there were kind of a lot of it was people around my age who, you know, we'd grown up with games and it was our medium, you know, and we got to a stage in our life where we wanted these games to do and address more serious subjects. Um, and uh, I think you missed out the train as well, by the way, which I think really took. Uh, board games uh, into that category, but I, I think it was just a oh here's here's a collection of games uh, that are actually addressing subjects that are serious. Um, I think that actually we're now in a more interesting period, which is yeah we can, you can now do it. What what are you doing? You know, what are the new genres? What are what are what are the periods that artists are going to go through? Um, and I think it's much more interesting than the. I, I mean I think just. You mentioned serious subjects, and then you get into this other category, serious games, yes. which are not art games. They're sort of generally soulless and designed by a committee with an agenda and a big budget attached to them. Uh, is a different thing, but definitely a lot of serious issues are, are, are like explored through games now, and that's almost like this gold rush right now for people who want to do that. But I think it's very different than just saying I want to put a serious topic on the game, we're talking more about kind of a personal, more subjective perspective on seriousness, right? Not necessarily making a simulation, an objective model of serious. I mean, I'm just saying it's a no, distinction I, I think it's really important. Because yeah. It's not just about serious content, it's about subjectivity. Can I, can I just, I, I think that when the subject, because you put it before and I think it's right, is, um, I suppose I define it as taking on subjects that are not unusual for other art forms, but have been, are extremely unusual for games. Um, and you know, to, to this day, I've been saying it for 10 years now, and I really should stop making them. But it, it actually blows my mind that even in commercial games, you know, something which is a home run money maker, like you can print money with crap, like romantic comedy, doesn't exist in video games. And it just, it, it, I really should just go ahead and make a company and make some money out of it and <laughs> just have done with it. But I think there's a whole category of subjects that are unusual for games, but very you know, usual for other art forms like poetry and so forth. So. Uh, something about you know, the Trinity you mentioned before, John, mm -hmm. uh, about Ray and Passage being you know, the, always the same, we always rehash the same games. I think what happens is that. Uh, when they started showing up, like when Rod made the marriage, uh, he was trying to do something very specific with, with art, which is, okay, what happens if I express through rules, right? It's kind of basic. So he made this, this experiment that is, it's interesting. Uh, it's cool, it was necessary, because nobody asked that, squ that question before. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's, it doesn't feel, like during the marriage, it doesn't feel like, okay, this is what games could do the best games could do was art, right? But it was a necessary step in between. And then uh, all this discussion uh, started about what happens if we uh, use dynamics, what happens if we express through dynamics like Jason Rodman again called perfectionism, which is not as well as widely known as his uh, the rest of his games, which is sort of based on uh, the dynamics of the game, the choices you make and the variables you are taking into account when you're playing uh, are actually uh, are actually triggering stuff uh, that resembles uh, the way you behave in real life, like the attitudes you are going to have towards dynamic systems. Uh, but I think what happened then is 
All right, we got all this thing. The, this 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 whole whole family of arguments showed up, and there's a lot of. I mean, there's there's still new arguments coming up. Uh, these small games that have these themes and then, and, and they're trying to do something with, with dynamics and, and, and all mechanics. Uh, but I think the next the next step, uh, which Braid sort of did, um, is uh, what happens with the the, the the core of how games how how games feel, what games are, uh, the aesthetics or, or of playing a game. Like being being an author in that field is like. Oh, 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 right. Here, here's the thing. If you want to express through rules, you can, you know, grab the marriage and say, okay, maybe I can do something with this. If you want to express through dynamics, you can think about it. But it's a lot. It's it's a much harder problem, right? To express through dynamics because now you have to make rules that make dynamics that feed into what you want to do, right? But then the aesthetics of play are are a more complicated thing because they are relying on dynamics. But you only write rules, so. You know, creating an aesthetic of play, authoring an aesthetic of play, of play uh, is very difficult. It's a very difficult problem, um, and, and we're most. I think we're most uh, stumbling into the blindly trying to do that. We just bump into discoveries. Is that you know, it, it's it's such such a hard problem to say. Okay, this is how people are going to feel about the whole experience of playing this game. We don't rely on themes. Uh, it's very hard. Nobody knows how to do that properly, right? Um, and. Uh, I think the gap is so large uh, between you know making the kind of arguments that have been done so far and making this new kind of arguments. The gap is so huge that uh, it's going to take a while. I think it's going to take a while for new games to replace you know Braid and, um, and, and, and Passage and, and the classical arguments. Well, would, but are, are, there, are the folks who made those games even making games that I think of in that light anymore? I wonder. Is that yes? Okay. I think, I think so. can, can I get a long announcement and then I'll shut up on that Brenda and Pedro talk? Um, so the uh, uh, first one anecdote, um, uh, I met Daniel um, the day I uh, showed the marriage at GDC and in his very direct English back then he walked up and was like, you know, when I first saw it I thought it was a bunch of bullshit, um, <clears throat> but now I think maybe it's kind of interesting. <laughs> and then I, I paused and I said, well, thank you, and he said, by the way, you've never been divorced, have you? So he's like, no. He was like, yeah. And walked away. And that was uh, <laughs> how I met Daniel, which I thought was rather good. Um, the, 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 the <laughs> actually, I, actually I, I, I've done a, uh, I did one with a, uh, uh, which I haven't released, I really should, but a friend of mine asked me to do a same sex marriage one, so I've got one with two blues and two pinks, if anybody wants it. Uh, but the, um, uh, the, the other thing you were talking about, I think, is, is very important. Uh, the whole point that I wanted to do was express things through mechanics because I believe that mechanics and game rules are the center of games. So, you know, that, that, that was the area I wanted to uh, work on. But I don't think that that's just one tool. And I think it's a good place to start, but there's a, uh, George, George Bernard Shaw wrote this review of a play in the 1920s. And he said, you know, a good play and a good work of art is like a church organ. You have, there are these three keyboards and there's the bottom keyboard, which is the bass, and it gets you in the gut. And then there's the, um, the middle keyboard, which is your entertainment, and it gets you in the heart. And then there's the top keyboard, which gets you in the head. And I think that when you're doing mechanics and uh, you know, expression through game rules, um, I, I think I've been pretty successful at getting the head bit. The other stuff, not so much. I think you need other things there. Um, it, it's interesting because I don't necessarily see things just, you know, this is the aesthetic and the mechanics and the dynamics. I think, see things like in all the, the art games or what would be classed as art games that I've made or that I'm currently working on, I'm just interested entirely in systems. And the rest of the game truly seems to make itself. I mean, if I can accurately identify the system and figure out where you're going into it, the whole rest of the game just seems completely obvious to me. Because I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not a painter and, you know, God help us if I ever had to do art for a video game, um, although that could probably be a pretty funny looking video game. Um, you know, I have to build things with my hands, so I tend to work with found objects or, or things that I can mold into a shape and that are forgivable. Uh, or forgiving, I mean, forgivably. Yeah, maybe both, maybe both. Um, but I don't see them as these, these separate things. It's just I'm making a system, and I'm going to put you into the system, and all those pieces go together. Yeah, I notice, um, you know, when people think about experimental games, um, or 
when I talk about experimental games, I always, I break it up into three categories, um, which I see a lot of, I think all three of you maybe think of them a little differently than me, but uh, which one prioritize the system. But I always think that experimentation in games, you know, it can happen in many places, but if you were to categorize it, it would be gameplay and mechanics, it would be visuals, and it would be feet. And I think actually, I, like, I, lo I would like to think that, yeah, you need all of those. They all have to be kind of uh, different and creative and, and, and sort of true to, and unique to the particular project, but I actually don't think that's true. I think you can actually have one of those things um, be arty or different uh, or experimental, and that's enough for me. So uh, examples, just take a game that's... Oh, the first one would be like gameplay mechanics, and the second one would be visual aesthetics, and the third would be theme. So I think you could look at things like, let's take something that's like the most cliche given in the middle of games, like a uh, first person shooter, or uh, with you know aliens and you shoot them, or Starcraft, or medieval Warcraft. And then you just say, okay, I'm gonna skin this. I'm gonna say, we'll leave the rules as they are, We'll leave, so we'll leave the mechanics as they are. Um, we'll uh, leave the visuals kind of in that same style, someone drawing things, kind of learned how to illustrate in the illustration school, and they're using Maya and all the same tools. And then we'll change the theme to, you know, uh, I don't know, gay revolution, you know, and suddenly you have something very different. And there are a lot of art games that do that. They don't touch mechanics. So the whole idea of like modding games and skinning them, that's what it was all about. I mean, does, does anyone know the game Biotech Kitchen? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Really early, 96. Uh, you know, that's 15 years ago. That was just a skinning, and the game was about like, you know, genetic engineering in the kitchen, but it was basically a first person shoot. All they did was change one of those elements. You do the same with visuals. You take something, you kind of leave the game. So, anyone know Tom Betts? So, Tom Betts basically. QQQ, he took like a Quake server, left the rules the same, left the visuals the same, but like, I mean, left the theme the same, people shooting each other, left the rules the same, but added like a glitch, so the game just leaves trails forever. So you're on the server and you're playing this thing. So visually, it's so mind-boggling and different that the whole thing just changes, you know? Uh, Vuk Kosick, another artist, net artist, made an ASCII Unreal. Took Unreal and skinned it all with just ASCII art. Same game, same stuff, completely radically different experience. Uh, Jody, untitled game, Wolfenstein 3D, same rules, same mechanics, same theme in a way, it's still called, but all the graphics are just grayscale squares. So there's visual exploration. And then the third one is the most easy, the one you guys have talked about the most, mechanics, you know, really exploring what can mechanics do, and of course the themes are also in all these examples. So I'm, I'm curious, those, uh, those reskinning games, uh, were, were they, without wanting to get too pretentious, but what the hell, we're on our games panel, um, <laughs> were, 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 they meant to, were they primarily a commentary about uh, uh, the video game culture, or were they completely separate from that, and they were a visual spectacle? It, I mean, they, a lot, they were a comment on video games as a cultural form, but also on the art world, right? Like ours, Doom, yeah. for example, which is, Taking, making a mod of Doom that's based on a uh, particular space at Ars Electronica in, I think, 1996. They curated a show of works that were created to be hung on the walls inside the mod, and the people could run around inside of it and shoot at the art as a way of commenting on the work. So there are people commenting on the art world, commenting on pop culture, commenting on... But not only kind of... In not only trapped in that internal life. Mm -hmm. Like uh, Mongrel is a group from England, they made uh, Blacklash. It's basically like a game about racism, it's basically a shooter. It's still playable, it's not about the art world, it's about an issue. You know, uh, Blast Theory. Mm -hmm. yeah. They're game designers, but they do hardcore, weird, crazy games. That to me is, in a way, it, you, can't, you can't kind of vilify that for being kind of playing art world games in a way. <laughs> it's really, no, I, I didn't say it's a bad thing. No, I, I, I feel that too, believe me. But, um, but like, like, like Blast Theory are to me probably my favorite game design group because they do things that work as games. They're hardcore, they're extreme, they're surprising, they're multidisciplinary, they're visual. That 
to me is that there are art games and game art combined in the people. They're delivering playable games. It's not trapped in the logic of a subculture, be it art world or indie game panels. It's just, hey, put it out on the street, people will come, they'll get it, they'll enjoy it. So, yeah, I mean, I'm just saying, mechanics is for me not 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 the starting point really so in this i just know but that's a that's a big sort of line between the the indie game community's approach to this idea versus the art world's approach to what games can mean and for the art world games are essentially a tool set and a slice of culture and a visual, <laughs> and a visual yeah right I, I kind of embody that inside the slice of culture right um and so there's a very different uh, values they're placing on um, games as a cultural form. Is that because uh, the art world is, uh, unlike, as you said, a hundred years ago, you came from craft and then you broke out. Now it's coming from an individual artist and you just are breaking in into any particular craft you like? Or it's like craft, I mean, there's like, they're just different value props. There's different places the culture is placed, the value of the work. And the art world largely is not as concerned with craft anymore as the games community is. The games community is very, you know, will disagree with me in a second, but I feel like the, the games community is still very, um, it's very inward looking and it's very intent on figuring out its form. Right, like what, what do games do? We're still kind of chewing on that, and the art world, you know, it, the trajectory of the history of art in the last 500 years is one about image making, right? And the how to how to make images got figured out quite a while ago, right? So they're not worrying about that anymore. They're worrying about other things now. But, I was just going to say, and yet they still worry about. It. And yet they still worry about it, and it cycles okay. back. Yeah. Everything still drives the art world. Mm -hmm. well, they still have something to sell, but that's a different. They what? They still need something to sell. At the end well, of the day. I mean, I'm not being cynical. I mean, you know, I, am. I know, I know, but I think, I think <laughs> yeah. it's, it's easy to be cynical about the art world. But yeah. but it, it is a lot more diverse than people think. You know, it, it involves a lot of real, dynamic, you know, not for profit for for, for communicating with people. Mm -hmm. And there is this, of course, very horrible. Sort of market economy that drives it, but we see that in every kind of right. media form. We, we feel your pain. Yeah, <laughs> yeah well, that, that raises it's, it's another topic. Just navigate around. It's just another constraint. <laughs> for, for me, uh, like an interesting, uh, particularly for you two, Brenda and Rod, is the fact you both live very deeply in the commercial world, and you're both very important people over here on the sort of the indie scene, the art game world. And what, what tensions, if any, are there for you all living in both of these places? And how does that impact your work, or does it? Uh, it's, it's really two different sides of my brain. You know, when I'm, uh, when I'm making a commercial game, which I'm doing right now, uh, I mean, I, I guess the, because it's important to me that the art games are actually valid games and they are they are fun in and of themselves you know in, in the case of my games sometimes not sometimes it's almost all the time you you can't know what the game is about uh during the initial test because otherwise it probably you know you would be so focused on that you wouldn't actually be able to tell me is the game fun in and of itself um, so just the, the fundamentals of game design are the same in both places but my process in making the, the art games is completely different it's a completely different process. The instincts that I rely on and uh, the things that I'm time, trying to tap into are um, wholly unrelated. And it almost feels like you know two different people are showing up to design a game. The I, I feel like uh, all my all my colleagues uh, in the commercial industry, you know, in fact, surprisingly, so are very supportive of the work that I do in art games. Uh, and I've never had anybody, except maybe in the early days of trying, some people commented, you know, they hadn't seen the game and they just, you know, said, said things about it uh, that kind of didn't make any sense once they'd actually seen the game. Um, you know, even here at Indicator, I remember when I first displayed Train, uh, the place where it was displayed here, the, the, uh, the gallery owner was not too happy to have a game of that topic in his place. Um, and so there were a lot of questions about could you even make a game, uh, and should I even call it a game? And in fact, just for the record, I never actually called Train a game. Uh, the rules I went um, 
I went to extremes, never to refer to it as a game. I mean, try writing a set of rules for a game and never refer to the terms like that in, or in the, in the description of it. I now say it's a game because, you know, it's a series of six games and it would sound odd uh, to say five games and one um, object, I guess. Uh, but I really, I, I, find, um, I find that by whatever I'm doing in an art game directly fuels my pa refuels my passion for making games again. I mean, I've been doing it a long time. I, I can't imagine ever doing anything else, but um, being here and engaging with people and saying to John last night, it's absolutely critical that I spend at least four days a year talking to people who understand uh, the importance of these games to me. Um, and you know, they, they don't make any money, at least for me, um, and I'm sure they never will, and I don't care if they ever do, but it's, it's something that I have to do. So you know, that's my very long answer to, it seems to work fine. <laughs> Yeah, I, similar answer. I, I made a conscious decision just to put a tax through my head and see what personality is. And I, I, uh, hopefully, some of the commercial work I do has you know, some kind of redeeming value. Uh, but the, the aims are so completely different. Um, you know, my aim is to entertain the maximum number of people possible. Uh, and I, I think that's a noble thing to do. Um, but that has nothing to do with what I do when it comes to the art games, which are. Um, if anything, try to give a taller and taller peak experience to an ever diminishing number of people. And I think, you know, with, with my latest game, I think I've got down to an audience of about 12, and that feels good. That's, that's, that's good. Uh, but I, I think that the, uh, Brenda touched on it, but, but, but I think commercialism is, uh, is something that I, I strongly rail against when it comes to my own work, because I think it's kind of poison. Um, but, but then again, I don't have to go and make a living out of it, so it's easy for me to say. I have um, this, one of the things that delights me about our games, like I, I've spent even time on the panel because I can't help but think about it. I'm probably a month away from finishing a new, a new game thing. It's not a game, actually, it's a pre-game, not game. I don't know what to call it yet. Its name is Preconception, and then I don't know who's after that. Um, but where I'm going to release the game, and since my art games so far are not digital, um, actually I have the choice, like, where am I going to release this game? Am I going to release it at, uh, you know, I can think of ridiculous things, where was the game released? And if you're digital, you can't do that, right? I mean, you'd say where you were at the moment that you uploaded it onto the internet, right? But I could actually go to your house and release it there if I wanted to, and could choose that. I, uh, for one game that I have, uh, The New World, it'll be released at Harvey Smith's house, he's the designer of Deus Ex. And, Eventually, when it gets to Austin, this game that's been finished now for at least a couple of years will actually get released. So these things really delight me, and, I, and they they feel my excitement in games. You know, things we don't necessarily think about. Uh, they're just wonderful luxuries that I have as a designer in making these games. Um, oh, I just <coughs> microphone. Um, so you mentioned fun, and that to me is, I think, one of the most difficult things to struggle with when it comes to making games is the idea that that is kind of the ubiquitous metric for games. When you know, if you were to poll a thousand people and ask them what what do you care, how would you value a game? What's the one word you would, you would generally choose to value? Fun. You know, I ask my students. I teach every uh, quarter. You know, define what you think uh, makes games good or compelling. You'll find it's basically always the top and by a lot, you know, like, uh, I'd say like eight out of 10 people end up saying that. And that's a big kind of issue, you know, so you're talking about, you know, romantic comedy, you're talking about documentary, you're talking about games about the Holocaust, you're talking about the idea that fun is still the metric for compelling game design is a huge problem. It's a huge, it's, it's hard to like pretend it's not there. I mean, we all try, I think, here. <laughs> to kind of work around that, but that's a big problem. It's sort of like saying, well, I'm making a film, but it's boring, or, or it's, it's really long and the acting is bad. I don't really know what the equivalents are, but, and you do see those movements in film, experimental film, deliberately going against conventions. But fun is one that you really have a choice, or it's a, a very conscious decision when you design an experimental game. Am I gonna, try, like Brenda, you mentioned you're trying to also make it fun. Uh, some people would say, well, I want to make it not fun. Uh, and and each, but that decision is, is central, I think, to making any kind of experimental game. Where are you placing fun in your B 
be a kind of uh, plan? Well, I, I think fun, so fun as a term is problematic. It's like art, right? It's, its definition is incredibly fuzzy. I would say that in many cases, you know, I, I saw a movie last night, <clears throat> I saw Drive, and it was incredibly engaging uh, and highly gross at certain points in time. Um, but, you know, that was, that's how I would define it. Like, the Irish game is a very engaging game. So it's able to support itself and, and hold people's attention. And I think that's, in many cases, when a game developer says they want to make a fun experience, that's what they're talking about. They're not talking about a ratchet and plank like platform, right? I mean, I, I wonder though if we should at least think, think about changing that language. Because fun, no matter how we see it, definitely means something to, to most people. It's not what you describe, you know, engaging, compelling. It means fun, it means lighthearted, it means joyful. I don't know, I mean, you know, a lot of the, the shooter community, when they think of fun, I don't think they're thinking of lighthearted. You know? <laughs> I mean, and they say those games are just incredibly fun, you know? Like, like Minecraft is incredibly fun, but it's, you know, I don't, I, it's, it, it's inc when I say fun, I mean, like, where the beep did that 12 hours go fun, you know, that's. No, I mean, you're right, it's probably not that narrow, but still, it seems too narrow to me. It seems to get in the way. Actually, you just you just just touched on the uh, where did those twelve hours go? Uh, that 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 area of games, I mean, I, I kind of queasy on it. It kind of worries me. And uh, uh, Jonathan Blow brought it up, brought it to my attention um, a few years ago when he did a lecture, and it really stuck with me. Um, it kind of worries me. I I, I I do have this concern that our medium is a bit different and is a bit too powerful for its own good sometimes. And I, kind of scares me. So I think that adds an extra responsibility when it comes to art games where you're actually addressing themes that are a bit less trivial than hitting monsters on the head. Um, so anyway. Yeah, I think, I believe it was uh, Jason Rohr's micro-talk this year, right, where he was trying to draw this analogy between film, or really storytelling and the role of plot and progression and challenge is that thing to games, right? It's not fun, but instead to challenge being that carrot on the stick or the thing that keeps us on the rail or however you want to think about it through the experience. And I think challenge does then exist in the games that all of you make, right? Whereas fun may not be present there. That's a more interesting way to think about it, I think. Um, so one one question for you all, it's kind of very open. Um, I hope we also have some time for questions, but how do our games matter? Like how, and how has the fact that these games exist impacted games as a whole? Or has it? Had they? Well, I, I, do, I do think our games started, started a new discussion, right? I was, I was thinking as you was talking about you know fun that our games has have been very good at exploring being boring. So <laughs> <laughs> serious. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. They are not the first one to try. Uh, but one thing that happened is that I think first of all they legitimize uh, trying. Right, uh, trying to you know make a game that is trying to shy away or is, is trying to uh, avoid just just um, having fun as the core value. Mm -hmm. I think they started they allowed that that possibility to happen. Um, I I also think that um, in order for this the first argument to happen, um, a more thorough. Uh, way of analyzing games have to happen. Like we have to think games a little little bit more deeply in order to do this. It's just not we're not going to just take refuge on themes, you know, like in cutscenes, text and just that. So we need to think about games a bit more deeply and we did so far. Um, but I think but I think what what really what really is 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 important for me to happen with our games is that we figure out how can we find how, how can we find magic within 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 our games that we cannot find anywhere else. Uh, something that that uh, that I realize you know um, in, in 
by the playing games and you know going to art galleries and stuff. Is that something? There's there's at least one thing that games are good at that ha that contemporary art doesn't do for, which is uh, which is having having epiphanies. You know, there's a difference between epiphany and learning. You know, epiphany is when you have this this this, this conscious uh, realization that allows you to rethink everything you saw you've seen so far in a different light and maybe do other stuff that you didn't notice before. Uh, and you can actually do that. You can actually do that in a video game. Yeah, yeah. And, and that that kind of epiphany uh, haven't happened for me with contemporary art. When I when I look at it now, it does just that just doesn't happen to me anymore. Can you give an example? Example. <laughs> well, I have a very fresh example, but I can't actually give it because the game is not released yet. Uh, which is John Blow's Witness. He has one of these moments in which you say, "All right, I, the fact that games can do this is actually is actually very interesting, and I haven't. It's actually very cool, and I haven't. And it's been a while since I had this kind of feeling." When you say you don't find it in contemporary art, are you including literature and film? Well, yeah, I don't, I don't read every book and watch it. I'm just, I'm just, I just, it's just like a, like a gunshot, you know, you know going to, going, going to art, art galleries for years, stuff like that, and, and, and it's, it, there were interesting experiences, but they didn't go there. You know, I'm not saying they're inferior. I'm just saying that they're not going there. I mean, you could, I could potentially get behind that thinking, but not really distinguish games in that sense, from literature, or film, or theater, or uh, spoken word poetry, or, or plenty of... Uh, right. I mean, you could say, I look at a painting, it never right. it feels a Right, 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 that's right. Maybe, yeah, maybe I should have been more specific. Um, you know, interactive art? <laughs> right. Oh, I'm, yes. All right. I mean, I mean uh, I'm, I'm the person that always says that interactive art should basically be thought of as a subset of games, and right. not, not anything separate, right. just badly designed games. You find. Right, well, yeah, okay, yeah, okay. well, that's, that's, that's the thing. So, uh, they have a lot of craft and money. Strike that from the record. <laughs> <laughs> a future grant. <laughs> uh, I, I return the time to the audience. Um, it's just one so my score. Um, I find this this do do they matter? Have they mattered? I mean there's there's lots of people um, who have talked about the you know the games that we've talked about up here and, and perhaps those games have made a difference in commercial games, but I often find that in the in the mass community we're so missing we we really haven't made a tremendous impact. I find I'll hear people when you bring up uh, certain art games, and you call them art games, or you call it certain class of games art games, and it will sometimes provoke this very defensive response, saying, well, you know, who's to say that you know, Gears of War isn't an art game? It's a very art game, and, and it has this odd, I don't know. Um, I, I just think we, have, we still have quite a ways to go. Uh, and even in terms of shows that are, that are highlighting just art games, there seemed to be a big flurry of them a, a little while back. Uh, and as far as I'm aware, there's, you know, there's some happening in Baby Castles in New York, and there's, there's several in Brazil that, that that interest seems to have, have waned. Yeah, I mean, I, about a year ago, I started doing research into like, exhibitions of games in our context, and in the lab, between 95 and 2006, I found at least 75 of them. But I would dare say that most of the folks at this conference know of maybe five of those, unless they happen to have works in those shows. Um, so I mean, the influence has been felt and it's sort of waning. I mean, something that really struck with, stuck with me from Christian Paul's talk about the history of games was like, um, you know, what are you people whining about? She didn't say it in those words exactly. As you know, all of the kind of media art forms, games have had the best success by far in having an impact in a variety of worlds. And what are you people complaining about? Um, yeah. I, I actually, I take back my time. Okay. I, I strongly agree with that because yeah. I do paint. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. 
I mean, I mean you, 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 you worry about attention, you try being a painter, try being a poet. Uh, and and I, I think that one of the, I, I actually would like for art games or whatever it is we do to uh, get a little bit less popular. Um, and, uh, because I, I think that the path of, for example, modern poetry, uh, yeah, that's my goal. I'd love to have that, of like dozens of dozens of these crappy little journals nobody reads, and the standard of poetry is being raised constantly. It's this wonderful uh, art form that I, so I, 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 I would aspire to. So you want contemporary poetry and not indie film? That is the trajectory. You don't want it to be Sunday and Safari or whatever you might call it. Do you really want me to go into why I don't think films are particularly good art form? If it no, was, no, no, no. <laughs> Another time. All right, well, let's uh, take some questions. I see Zach's hand. Hey, so um, I kind of come from the hard side of things, like Edo, so I have a bit of a different perspective on this, and maybe I just have really bad taste. But one thing that I kind of found um, with this kind of conversation is it seems like the definition of art games is both vague and narrow. Mm -hmm. And that makes it really hard to sort of discover new works or even think that new works are existing. And I, I guess I wonder why we're putting so much emphasis and veneration on this sort of holy trinity of games. And it seems like, to me, we kind of do that because they were framed in a certain way and that kind of introduced this scene, this like game scene, to this sort of art context. And that's why we look at this stuff. But they're not particular, they're great games and I love them and I think they're wonderful art kind of projects and experiences, but they don't seem particularly different than something like Katamari Damashi or Shadow of the Colossus or earlier works. And I guess I feel like this stuff has kind of existed in games as long as we've been exploring video games and it's continued to exist afterwards when you look at um, things like Small Worlds or even like Doug's new game, like. Um, because of both that you play in the dark. And people are exploring these sort of mechanical situations and messing around with rules and how that's affecting things. Uh, and I think there have actually been a lot of games that have done that. And I guess they're not as visible because you know the first experiments that introduce you to a field seem vastly more important than any later experiments, even if the later experiments are discovering something that's small but also just as meaningful. So I know that was more of a comment than a question, but I guess I'm just wondering like, what you guys think of that and, and if that seems to be the case to you guys or not. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely don't ascribe that that canon. That's not my thing. How dare you, sir? I mean, I think maybe if you really dig in, everyone has a different idea about it. I don't think there's consensus here about that. Uh, it's not from this side. But, um, you know. Yeah, I, it just seems like there's a lot of room for like a very broad kind of conversation on this. And, and I think like panel-wise, not, not like this is awesome, like I'm not you know, dissing anything, but like I think that there are like a lot of room for panels. And even at places like GDC like, like, and, and, and here more stuff, like I think there are a lot of ways that we could look at games and sort of pick ones out and say like, oh, you know, like, like Minecraft, I got lost in Minecraft. I've never been lost in a game before like desperate to find something that I built and thought I may never find it. Like that small experience, while encapsulated in a large game that isn't necessarily targeted as an art project, was just totally astonishing to me and something that I've never had before. And I think on the level of something like playing grade and discovering, you know, how it I, I, I think that's I think that's right. I, I certainly wouldn't disagree with you. I, I, I would say that that experience of being lost in Minecraft, um, I wonder if that's what well, one of the things I like about uh, uh, games and what we do is they just elbow into other art forms all the time. And so when you were talking about Minecraft, I love it as well. Is I, I get that sense of are we kind of elbowing into architecture and you know playground design and park design? And I think it's great. Uh, so I, I would agree with you. I think it's very broad. Um, oh, John's in the back. He's going to object. Yeah, he's Objection in the house. No, I have a four-word comment in reply to that, which is art doesn't mean good. Right. That's true. So, yeah. yeah, lots of games have been experienced. Oh, we lost is terrible. No, but it's good. Yeah, yeah. Well, Zach experienced the sublime inside of Minecraft. Yeah, I think. Most of the defensiveness that comes out when, when, when you say art game is because in people's mind, art means good. Like, we've got that culturally built in. If you just completely erase that association and say that art is more about it, 
or a framing, then, then all that argument goes away. I, I agree completely. Brenda, I think you were going to say something. I don't get it. I don't remember. It's gone. Yeah. yeah I can okay. You're going to comment, or I just, just shut down? No, I, I was I, I was I was going to reaffirm that I actually I'm the meatest, and I do believe that some things are better than others. And, uh, but I think but that's I a think different point. Out of that ground. <laughs> that's a very different point than what John's making. I think there's like there's yeah, yeah. good food, and that doesn't make it art. That just makes it tasty or nutritious or <laughs> what have you. Yeah, and there's bad art. And um, so yeah, I think it is. There, there's a lot of anxiety around um, respect, right? and being privileged and so on that comes around this. But anyway, yeah. yes? Yeah, so I um, sort of what this breaks down to me and this sort of semantically, there's games, there's game art, art games, and then the larger discourse of games as art. And so when those, when you have that sort of, did that kind of, kind of discourse where you're using these terms to frame that, and that starts to encompass a lot of other things, is there something we're struggling to defer, we're starting to really define our games. Is there are there other terms that will come to represent that sub niche as we as this larger conversation about games as art kind of spins out or or dies or whatever? I mean, I, I, I have a, an answer to that, and is that I, I feel like my, my hope is that uh, this conversation stops yeah. and we yeah. just accept games as games and we don't worry about legitimacy or what have you. We just push games where games need to go for me. But. I like that. Now we've got legitimacy and we're all for it. Who cares? <laughs> the, the same before it wasn't as much fun. I mean, do, do you feel that the, whatever, this subculture within games of art games is stifling in any way to, to people? I, I didn't feel that. Does it seem... I don't feel like the, it's within the art. I feel like a lot of the folks who are making these games have sort of moved way past this conversation, right? I feel like it's, it's, it's um, kind of out more in the... Um, player community perhaps to some degree or, or the game industry as a whole and certain anxieties about its position in culture and that's where to me it is going on. Well, well there, there is a, an unfortunate economic motive as well that um, I, I think you'll find a lot of the, the games industry, which again I work in, uh, are very pleased to have art games around because they, they do provide a a fig leaf against legislation. Oh, hey, look, we're not for. Uh, therefore, you know that the, these these are these are good. You shouldn't be regulating us. So I would be. Uh, there's not entirely pure motives for uh, a lot of industry support. Yeah. And, I mean, I say I'm sure other people here uh, engage in a more uh, old-fashioned uh, infrastructure <coughs> that supports the arts, uh, whether it's in the U.S. or globally. Or in the educational systems, and for me, I mean, if, if these games didn't exist, um, the sort of subset of games that I can show someone who's in their 70s and has been funding indie film for their whole life, and say, and, and when they think of games, it means you know something they saw on TV or something their children play, or something that got bad press for violence. Uh, it's it's you know it's amazing to be able to say well I have a hundred games on my laptop I'm going to show you a quick presentation and it's going to change the way you think about this medium and where it's going mm -hmm. so whether you're trying to build a new graduate program in art school or get federal funding for games uh, as culturally uh, sort of detached from the industry um, it's amazing it's been amazing to be able to say. Now there's hundreds of examples rather than a dozen examples ten years ago. So, in that sense, I think you know there's definitely uh, a lot of value in that sort of subculture. Whether it's a I don't know it's a movement, I don't know how people can find it, but I think it's been useful to bring games like that to the forefront. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Thank you. Uh, so uh, my question is more about the language. Um, art and design in their relationship, and a term that hasn't been used in this conversation is critical design. 
And so I, I wonder, like, what do you find any relationship between the way that critical design is related to art to the way that art games are related to art? And can we see some art games as like, critically designed pieces? What, what do you mean? So, critical design in the, like, in the like, not in the um, discipline of product design, how they design products that are. That, that, that's, that's just an example of a game that fits them. Or I would say, for example, Top Liquor or Lose Lose. For me, I believe they're critical design. Or Mary's, like Mary Flag and some of her work, perhaps. Joystick. Yeah, like Joystick, Giant Joystick. And that, that's, I'd like say, 80% of the um, game art canon is something like that. Yeah. You know, it's kind of a, a, a kind of counter you know, example of what mainstream games are, whether it's the theme or the way it's designed, the idea of non-fun games, boring games, games that parody other games, games that reference mainstream games. Yeah, I mean, that's... I think so much story. We've talked about that. In a but I think there's like a, a, a difference, I think, from what like Dumb and Ruby is they're, they're inside the belly of the design beast, right? using the methodologies of design in a critical way as opposed to a commercial way, or commercial and critical at the same time, perhaps, right? That's what you're speaking to. And that, you know, it's the, you know, the art games canon largely has not been dealing with that kind of possibility space of all of the possible topics and ideas one can deal with in their work. Anybody else have anything to question over? Oh. Did you have any questions? Okay. Um, uh, did you guys, did you guys ever wish you were an artist in the era or an art person? Uh, that is, art sometimes is thought of as good, but it also at least used to be thought of something that disrupted people's impressions and expectations. And I'm not sure art games are pissing anyone off. Right. The train has pissed a lot of people off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, and, and, I, and sometimes it pisses them off when, like, you know, like, it's not a good enough game. Like, oh, this isn't really a game. Like, right? That's not, maybe we're not in a very dangerous counter. The train did that. I mean, you know, I had, there were multiple well respected game designers who, without even seeing the rules, literally looked at the game and assumed they knew everything about it. Uh, they were wrong. They were incredibly wrong, and they've said they were incredibly wrong later, um, which is fine. You know, I've certainly blown off games uh, as garbage that I later played and thought were awesome. So I'm, you know, certainly not free from idiocy myself. The question that you asked, I, for some reason, I took it a completely different way, or I guess maybe I just heard the question that I wanted to be asked and I didn't know. Which is, you know, do I ever wish I could just make these games and just do nothing but make these games? And the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really, I really wish I could. Um, like I. This other game I'm working on is 50,000 pieces. You know, I, I just hope I live long enough to finish them. Um, because I do it in my spare time. You know, I wish I could take uh, two years off right now and just learn how to code so that I could make games uh, about whatever I wanted to on a computer and not have to worry about um, how I was going to feed myself. You know, that, I would love to do that. I mean, I think, uh, I mean, you're talking maybe in one respect of polemical games games that have a, let's say, a political or a social agenda and they're popular enough to piss people off who would come across them who aren't going there to be you know, riled up for what they already believe. I mean, then you're getting into all kinds of questions, basically, you know, like, like to me, the biggest problem with games now is, is the consoles and basically the command and control centralized distribution model of content for consoles and now Apple devices. So basically, anything you make that could be in these most um, popular mainstream form of the medium are, are there's gatekeepers, corporate gatekeepers who can just mix anything that is risky or dangerous. What you don't have, you know, like in television, you used to have that in the long in the old days. Once cable television happened, you basically have polemics built into a multi-platform system. So you have Fox News, that's gonna piss you off if you don't agree with it, but you still can see it. So you know, if we had the Fox News console, for example, <laughs> and, uh, move yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and the moveon.org 
console and those somehow would be accessible on the same device, uh, we get a really popular medium that is allowed to have risk, but is cut off at the distribution and, and production model, as well as you know, in financial viability as another sort of actor against any kind of polemical risk. So you end up with Grand Theft Auto probably being the most you know controversial game out there, and you have uh, you know I can think of Super Combine Massacre RPG, a game that you know made it out there at millions of pounds, upset people, you know. Uh, it didn't really have a point, you know, it was just kind of a weird juvenile gesture that made us think about games in an amazingly powerful way, but that would never go on a console, and that's the problem. So, I don't know, that's where we're screwed, really. I, I, it's I, getting worse. I, I think it's a very good question. I, I'd like to say a lot. I think Paolo Maldini, is that your pronounce his name? He does, Paolo. He, he does a lot of good sort of work, and, uh, you know, his, his app, which showed child labor making iPhones got banned from the iPhone, which is kind of entertaining. Um, and made the news. And made the news, yeah. Um, so I, I, my hope is that, you know, that there's an audience out there that will make more subversive games. Um, it, it, it can't come from me. I'm a middle-aged white guy, comfortably old, happily married. It's, it's tough for me to get angry about things. You know? <laughs> I'm glad you're happy. Yeah, I, I, I am. I, 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 I'm with the Smash Capitalism Brigade. I hope they're made. <laughs> oh, I tried. Well, I think that's kind of there, there you have another problem. Is that this medium you know, requires a lot of resources uh, to make, and therefore middle class, content white guys uh, tend to be the people who do most of this. And, and dissension is not necessarily going to come from people who don't have that sort of thing. Thank you. Oh, okay, I think we need to stop there, unfortunately. Uh, but thank you all for coming. Thank you, Brenda, Rod, Daniel, and Edo.